works towards solving these serious problems. I appeal to the common sense and compassion for veterans of my colleagues. My amendment is simple. Veterans deserve to be left out of this political fight. I reserve the balance of my time. General reserves the balance of time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I rise to claim the time in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the statistics about the delays in poor performance uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs with regard to uh, veterans' claims are reasons to oppose the gentleman's amendment. The amendment carves out of the RAINS Act's congressional approval procedures all regulations that affect veterans and veterans' affairs. RAINS Act supporters honor America's veterans. We want to guarantee that the regulatory decisions that affect them are the best decisions. That's why major regulations that affect veterans and veterans' affairs, like all other major regulations, should fall within the RAINS Act. Under the legislation, agencies with authority over veterans' issues will know that Congress must approve their major regulations before they go into effect. That provides a powerful incentive for the agencies to write the best possible regulations, ones that Congress can easily approve. And Congress will have every incentive to approve good regulations and every incentive to disapprove regulations that have led to the kind of uh, uh, delays and, uh, and uh, uncertainty that veterans face today. That's a solution that everyone should be able to support. Congress will be more accountable, agencies will write better rules, and veterans and all Americans will reap the benefit. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Well, thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and to my colleague, uh, I, I'm sure my colleague uh, agrees with me that we should not add hurdles. But let me tell you something. If this bill had been in place, we've passed um, 11 bills since September uh, on behalf of veterans. Uh, including the following uh, kinds of, of initiatives. Um, uh, the 9-11 GI Bill, which we all agreed upon, to co-payments for medication, resources for, ras for radiation poisoning, and had we had this bill in place, each and every one of these initiatives would have required a joint resolution from Congress each time uh, the administration, the VA, promulgated these rules. And if those sessions of Congress were like anything, like the majority's calendar for this year, we would have had uh, uh, not a lot of time <laughs> to have completed work. This year we've only passed 15 bills into law, a record low compared to last year. Um, and as the speaker just recently said, I suppose it would apply here, we should not be judged on how many laws we create, we should be judged on how many laws we repeal. And certainly we would not have been able to do things like the GI Bill or reduce co-payments for medication for veterans had we had this bill in place. Um, you know, the other thing is you would think that my colleagues would have some pride uh, in this institution. All this bill will do will put much more power within the hands of the executive. We, we can't appoint bureaucrats to conference committees on the budget. Uh, we can't uh, 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 get them. This time has expired. Thank you so much. I yield back. Recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself the balance of my time. I say to the gentlewoman, my colleague from Wisconsin, that uh, uh, this House is very proud of the fact that we've worked in a bipartisan fashion to pass all of those bills. Uh, and I have absolutely no doubt that if after we pass those bills, the Department of Veterans Affairs and other agencies affecting veterans didn't do the work properly and didn't get it done right, uh, that this Congress would again work in a very bipartisan fashion to say, no, you didn't get it right, get it right. That's what this is all about, and that's why the RAINS Act is so important, not just for uh, every other American, but also for veterans. This is something that will improve the regulatory process. Now, before my time expires, I want to... 
I, I, I don't have two seconds because I think I've got to get this uh, uh, in, into the, the record. Uh, and that is another study that talks about the creation of jobs, which are important to our veterans who've returned and are looking for employment in this country. Uh, this is a study by the Phoenix Center, uh, and it's uh, entitled Regulatory Expenditures, Economic Growth, and Jobs, an empirical study performed by three PhDs and a lawyer. What could be better than that? And uh, uh, I want to read from part of the abstract. It says, even a small 5% reduction in the regulatory budget, about $2.8 billion, is estimated to result in about $75 billion in expanded private sector GDP each year with an increase in employment by 1.2 million jobs annually. On average, eliminating the job of a single regulator grows the American economy by $6.2 million and nearly 100 private sector jobs annually. Conversely, each million dollar increase in the regulatory budget costs the economy 420 private sector jobs. A study that shows conclusively that we're right when we say that the RAINS Act will help to create jobs in this country and the current regulatory morass that we're facing in this country is costing American jobs. I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment and to support the underlying bill and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman, I'm all seeking all unanimous consent for the purpose all, of... All time has expired. Put uh, something in the record. Relief. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment Mr. is not Chairman, agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I would seek a roll call. Mr. Lady, request for a roll call vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin will be postponed. The gentleman from Virginia, rise. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee do now rise. The question is on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. And accordingly, the committee rises. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the. Uh, the whole House of the State of the Union having under consideration H.R. 367 directs me to report that it has come to no, it's come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 367 and has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair will entertain requests for one minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, request the analyst consent to address the House for one minute and rise and stand. The gentleman is, is recognized for me. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I addressed the positive economic impact on jobs of shale gas production that was documented during a recent hearing in Pennsylvania by the Bipartisan Natural Gas Caucus, which I co-chair. An additional area of economic impact of the natural gas production is the direct benefits to Pennsylvania. From 2008 to 2010, Pennsylvania established three leases for natural gas production on state forest lands. These leases have generated signing bonuses totaling $413 million and earned the state another $100 million in royalties. Since 2007, a total of $1.7 billion in corporate taxes have also been paid. During 2012 and 2013, the natural gas industry contributed $406 million in impact fees that are benefiting counties and communities across Pennsylvania. By 2035, shale gas will contribute $42.4 billion annually to Pennsylvania's economy, up from the $7.1 billion in 2010. Mr. Speaker, the economic impact from natural gas development in Pennsylvania is exceeding all expectations. Governor Corbett, and the Pennsylvania State Legislature are to be congratulated for their leadership in shale gas production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman kneels back. The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Lewis of Georgia for today and Mr. Young of Florida for today.
Without objection, the requests are accepted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Griffin, is recognized for the remainder of time until 10 p.m. as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to take a little time tonight with my colleague, Mr. Young, Representative Young from Indiana, to talk a little bit about health care in America. Talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act uh, that is currently being implemented and talk about the need for real health care reform in this country. And I want to start out by just emphasizing that I firmly believe we need health care reform. I believe that the health care reform we got in the form of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare um, is not the health care reform that we need. And I would say that we have lots of proposals here in the House. I think last Congress we had over 200 bills introduced that related to the health care system, reforming our health care system. And this Congress, we have dozens of health care reform related bills as well. So the idea that it's either the Affordable Care Act as we're seeing it unfold or nothing at all, it's a false choice. That's not the choice that we have. There are lots of ideas, lots of much better ideas, uh, I must add. And while I am personally for repeal, I certainly want the Affordable Care Act repealed. I want to replace it with quality patient center health care reform. I am not against providing relief to Americans who are feeling the burden of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare right now. In fact, we had a hearing on the implementation of uh, the Obamacare law in the Ways and Means Committee today, a committee of which I'm a member. My colleague, Representative Young, is a member. And we heard a lot of people say, hey, this is the law of the land. Don't mess with it. This is the law of the land. Let it go. This is the law of the land. Any attempt to criticize it, to discuss its shortcomings, is a waste of time. Well, I reject that outright. And, you know, I think the president, through his actions, has rejected that. What am I talking about? Well, it's interesting because we've passed seven bills in this House, seven bills that relate to Obamacare, changing Obamacare, repealing a part of Obamacare, seven that not only passed this House, we sent them to the other side of the Capitol, they passed the Senate, and you know what? The President signed them into law. That may come as a surprise to some folks, but it's the truth. We've passed seven bills to change, to modify, to repeal parts of, to make better Obamacare, and the President has agreed with us on all seven. He yep. signed them into law. Are, th are these some of the very same uh, bills? Uh, my good colleague, that uh, the President in recent speeches has characterized as partisan, misguided, meaningless. Um, I, I do believe you may be referring to some of those bills. Th those are the same bills, and I, will, I would like to go through, if, if I can, the seven bills and talk a little bit about what they do and how they were an improvement. And I think they are evidence that, yes, we'd like to replace this bill with something much better, this law. But in the short term, we will do whatever it takes to provide relief to American workers, relief to American families, relief to small businesses that are under the burden 
of Obamacare. So let me, let me mention a, a few of these. H.R. 4. H.R. 4, it repealed the small business paperwork 1099 mandate. Man, I remember when I first got to Congress, I heard from a bunch of folks about the 1099 filing obligation under the president's health care law. We repealed that. You know what the president did? He agreed. Bad part of the law. Next, H.R. 1473. We cut $2.2 billion from what was characterized as a stealth public plan, the consumer-operated and oriented plan, and froze the IRS budget. The president signed that into law. Next, H.R. 674, save taxpayers $13 billion by adjusting the eligibility for Obamacare programs. The president signed that into law. H.R. 2055 made more reductions to the consumer-oriented, operated and oriented plan that I mentioned earlier also to the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, an independent board that's going to cut Medicare because it hasn't been reformed when it runs out of money. So that was signed into law. And again, in today's hearing in the Ways and Means Committee, folks on the other side of the aisle were saying, ah, this talk, this criticism about the President's law, Obamacare, waste of time, meaningless. All politics. Hogwash. The president signed a bunch of it into law. Well, it is hogwash. And, um, you know, it's particularly hogwash because uh, among uh, those various reforms that you itemized there, uh, let's, let's reflect on how much persuasion, how much public argument was required to even bring the President of the United States to go along with repealing this egregious, superfluous 1099 repeal. We had to make the public argument. We had to win the argument. Um, because there was great reluctance, if recollection serves, and I think it does, uh, to make any changes whatsoever to what most Americans now know as Obamacare. The thought was, the thinking still seems to be, among a number of our colleagues, that if they touch the act, then that's going to lead to, to further reform, perhaps dissolution of repeal of the act altogether and replacement with something um, that is more patient-centered, with something, frankly, more bipartisan. And um, so to our colleagues that often level criticisms at those of us who, who are identifying ways to alleviate the pain on the American people with respect to this law, the so-called Affordable Care Act, um, I, I think it bears reminding the importance of continuing the argument, forcefully making the argument uh, about all the pain that it's causing. Precisely, and a lot of people ask, why all the focus? Why all the energy? Why all the speeches? Because it's important, number one. And number two, it takes the energy, the focus, the time, the prioritization, the resources to convince people, the president included, that this is not the way to go. Now, I think if you were to throw these seven different bills out there uh, a few years ago when Obamacare passed, and said, hey, what are the chances of the president signing this? People would have said, no way. No way it's going to happen. So it's a process. It's a process of making the argument with facts, not through personal attack, with facts. Make the vigorous argument. That's what this body in democracy is about. Make the argument, win the argument, and then repeal or change. And I would mention there are three more. H.R. 3630, 
slashed billions of dollars from some discretionary funds, some slush funds, where they had some flexibility to use, and the president agreed with that. He signed that into law. H.R. 4348 adjusted a drafting era, saved $670 million. And H.R. 8 repealed what was called the CLASS program, Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Program. The former Democratic chairman of the Senate Budget Committee called the CLASS program, quote, a Ponzi scheme of the first order, the kind of thing Bernie Madoff would be proud of, end quote. We saved billions of dollars with the repeal of H, uh, through H.R. 8. So, to reiterate, there are seven bills we fought hard for, and every single one of them ultimately were signed into law by the President of the United States. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the biggest change, the most consequential change to Obamacare, the most open and full recognition that the President's health care law is unworkable and problematic and a burden is the fact that the president himself just a few weeks ago on July 2nd through a blog post Department of Treasury blog post said you know what I am going to suspend postpone for a year the so-called employer mandate that is one of the key pillars of the Obamacare law. And what is that mandate? Well, the mandate is that every employer uh, across the United States of America who employs 50 or more persons on a full-time basis must provide government-sanctioned, government-approved health insurance to their employees. Now, look superficially. That sounds just great. There's some problems here. First, it, this law redefines full-time in a way that Americans have never understood it. If you, were to, ask, 30, if you were to ask me, what does full-time mean to you? I'd say, growing up in South Arkansas, full-time means 40 hours in a week or more, right? That's a common sense, practical application of what full time is. Would that be right? That's under what Obamacare? most Hoosiers think as well. Right? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I've traveled quite a bit, um, gotten to know people around the country, and I, I don't believe I've encountered, I reckon, anyone who thought that full time was 30 hours. So where did this come from? Out of, well, out of thin air. Presumably. So the bottom line is the president recognized, and I applaud him for this, I, I applaud him for recognizing the problem, the burden of his law, particularly the employer mandate. And he said, I'm going to postpone that part of the law. I'm basically going to repeal, in effect, in effect, repeal that for a year. Just make that go away for a year as a practical matter. Now, I applaud his recognition that the law has problems. The problem I had with that action is I don't think, still do not believe, the president had the power to do that. If he wants the law changed, should have called Congress. We would have been more than happy to deliver up a bill, send it over to the Senate that postponed the employer mandate a year. In fact, because of the president doing that, that's precisely what we did. So the, I introduced H.R. 2667 that does that in legislation. 
not through a regulatory change, a blog post, but I introduced the Authority for Mandate Delay Act, which we voted on, we passed on this floor. Why? It does the same basic thing, a little bit different, but the same basic thing that the President was doing. And we did it so that what he did would be legal. And you know what? Thirty-five Democrats supported this bill. Thirty-five Democrats supported this bill. And so essentially, I, I applaud them for doing it. You, myself, and so many other members uh, of this body agreed with the, the substance of the president's blog post. Though one would question whether we were intended to be a nation of laws or instead a nation of blog posts, we could get into that uh, separate conversation. I think fair-minded people agreed that the delay was appropriate. <coughs> Obamacare is not ready for prime time. The computer systems don't seem to be ready. Employers are confused about exactly how this law is going to work, exactly how it's going to impact them. Uh, employees are confused. And something had to be done. But I think that recognition that something had to be done only occurred because there were people in Congress making arguments as they continue to make arguments uh, with respect to the flaws in this legislation. And, and I would add to that, there are many of us that believe the reason this law is not working is because it will never work. It is unworkable by design. It is top-down. It is old way of doing things. In a world that is becoming more network, bottom-up, innovative, new way of doing things. This is an old, central control, top-down way of legislating. And so the president recognized that, but of course, for partisan politics reasons, even though my bill did basically what he, he did, he opposed it. He opposed the bill that would have made his actions legal. And of course, now it is sitting, napping, because we hope to awake it, snapping in the Senate, in the United States Senate, with your companion bill, the individual mandate. That's right. Delay. Well, kudos to the one of, what is it, six? Um, colleagues on the other side of the aisle that, that joined us in voting for your bill. 35 Democrats. 35 in total. That's right. I think one out of every six members That's right. of their conference That's exactly right. were supportive uh, of your bill. Uh, I think that was the right thing to do, the right vote to cast. Uh, it certainly preserved the precedent that it is this body that passes the laws, that develops the legislation. It's the job of the executive branch to sign those uh, various acts into law and then to execute them, not to recraft the laws as it might see convenient uh, for whatever motives. And so you mentioned my bill, um, which is really in the end the American people's bill, because it's designed to provide relief to American families. The Fairness for American Families Act. You know, thinking behind this is quite simple. If the president wants to offer businesses a relief from the employer mandate tax, as our Supreme Court has styled it, then why won't he offer relief to working Americans and their families? It's, it's that simple. And I have yet to hear an acceptable response. No, we're, we're playing politics. Well, are those one of nine Democrats who voted for my legislation also playing politics? No, I think they're, candidly, I think they're being fair-minded. Some would argue that they're looking for political cover or this or that. I'll let others assess that, but uh, certainly it's good legislation. It's fair and equitable legislation to, to accord the same sort of treatment to hard-working Americans that the president would give to the business community. And though I agree, let me go on record, that that business community needs relief too. 
Well, and, and one in nine voted of, of the Democrats voted for your bill. I think it was 22 total. Um, I think just a year or two ago, that would have been unthinkable. That's right. That 35 would have joined voting for the employer mandate delay and 22 or so for your bill would have been unthinkable. It is because we have been relentless in pursuit of a better way, relentless in pursuit of real health care reform, relentless in identifying and letting uh, folks in Washington know that the people back home, constituents, have made their voice very clear where I live in Arkansas on the issue of the Affordable Care Act uh, or Obamacare. And what's interesting uh, is today in the Ways and Means Committee, we had the head of the IRS testifying. And he was explaining why the president decided to delay for one year one of the two key components of the Affordable Care Act, one being the employer mandate and the other part of the, the law being the individual mandate. We know that the president delayed that one, the employer mandate, and he was explaining why he did that. And this is a paraphrase of what he said. It's the head of the IRS describing why the president gave one year relief to businesses impacted by the employer mandate. He said, to paraphrase, not a direct quote, but to paraphrase, he said, in effect, we heard from a lot of American small businesses, businesses that this was a burden on them, and so we acted to give them relief. That's a paraphrase, but that's effectively what he said. I agree with the general sentiment. It is a burden on American uh, workers and small businesses, et cetera, and they do need relief, and I'm glad they're getting it. But it raises the question, why wouldn't you give that same relief as a matter of fairness to individuals, families, workers impacted by the individual mandate? The other key component of Obamacare, of the Affordable Care Act. Why wouldn't, why would you give relief to small businesses and businesses and what have you, but not give relief to individuals? It fundamentally doesn't make sense. It's not fair. And when he said that, I thought to myself, well, is it possible that he doesn't know that the head of the IRS and the administration doesn't know that individuals and families and workers are also impacted in a negative way, that they are burdened, many of them, by this law. Yes, they want health care reform. Yes, people need insurance. Yeah. Yes, people want to be covered. But this is not the way to go. Does he not know the impact that this law is having? So I thought... Why don't we put all the opinion aside, yeah. the op-eds, right. the editorialist, and why don't we just talk about some of the news headlines? Without my commentary, I thought you and I could just read some of the headlines. These are news stories. These are news stories, not op-eds, not editorial writers. These are news stories from a variety of publications from around the country, and I thought it would be instructive to run through some of those tonight. And if you would help me Absolutely. Uh, tonight, yeah. so what I'll do here... There seemed to be a lot there. You know, so the list... How would goes, you like to proceed? The list, I? I tell you what, I'll read through one of these and I'll put one up. You yeah. can read through, then I'll take one. Okay. These are headlines from around the country, and we're going to run through them because they're, they are news stories that regardless of what you hear from this administration, these, this is what's happening around the country. Sure. 
the AP, Florida insurance officials' rates will rise under Obamacare. Georgia insurance rates spike under Obamacare. Now, I would point out, we don't have to guess what's going to happen anymore. We don't have to predict what's going to happen. Why? Because we're already there. Implementation is underway. It's already happening. So we'll just let the facts speak. Chattanooga business owner says Obamacare costing workers pay raises and benefits. Consumers could see 25% premium increases under Obamacare. UNA asks student employees to work fewer hours. So the Contra Costa Times of Concord says that half of the Affordable Care Act call center jobs will be part-time. The Missourian says Obamacare is going to impact Franklin County workers. The Weekly Standard reports Wisconsin grocery store forced to cut hours due to Obamacare. The Huffington Post reports that White Castle uh, indicates that Obamacare uh, is causing them to consider only hiring part-time workers. KHN indicates WellPoint sees small employers dropping their health coverage. I would, point, I would point out that these are from all over the country. Growing worries about Obamacare forcing insurers out of state markets. Iowa Public Radio. Full-time versus part-time workers. Restaurants weigh Obamacare. Obamacare forces work hour limits for CMU students. Brevard cut some workers part-time hours to avoid Obamacare rules. Obamacare delay is a relief for a family business. You know, so we're already picking up on some trends here. Um, from a number of the, number of the headlines, uh, we're getting the sense that, you know, this health care law is not what we were told it would be, what the American people were told it would be. It's not sustainable. That's why there's all manner of taxes, from medical device taxes to uh, what was once a tanning tax. Um, they're looking for revenue under every rock to make this thing sustainable. It doesn't control costs. By some estimates, in my own state, in the state of Indiana, premiums are expected to go up 70% plus within the next year or so. Um, the problems about access that we're hearing about that are captured in articles uh, around the country, rural areas in, in particular, can expect to have a shortage of doctors as a direct result of this law, and their quality concerns. Um, you know, I've just listed kind of my thoughts on what health care reform ought to accomplish. All those various things ought to, ought to happen. Unfortunately, Obamacare is failing on every front, and I don't say this with any celebration. I lament the fact, uh, and it's all the more reason that we need to continue to educate our colleagues and um, that minority of the American people that still believes uh, this is, this is going to work. Well, as we see here, Texas business owner facing $1 million in an annual in annual Obamacare cost. Maryland employers cutting hours due to Obamacare. Waitress says she's losing full-time status due to the Obamacare rule. St. Pete College, HCC, cut adjuncts hours over health care. Local entrepreneur sells part of business due to Obamacare. There are people behind every one of these headlines. Forbes says labor unions uh, are indicating that Obamacare will shatter our health benefits and cause nightmare scenarios. I ten, I, my recollection was that um, labor was very much behind this bill originally, and um, I'd love to work with them for any, any members of uh, union, any union leadership that's looking to be part of the solution here and help alleviate some of the pain. Um, welcome home. I, I share your feeling there. I, I found common ground with a lot of uh, labor union uh, folks uh, on the Keystone Pipeline because they want the jobs. Absolutely. And here, yeah. the labor unions are realizing 
This is a nightmare. Well, they're members. That's right. Uh, they're hearing from their members. That's leaders right. are. Their members are speaking out. That's right. Here you see restaurant shift. Sorry, just part time. There's a theme here. Yeah. Workers' hours cut. Obamacare blamed. And again, for those just tuning in, we're just reading news headlines, not op-eds. These are news headlines, stories from around the country. Everything from the Weekly Standard to the Huffington Post, the AP, you Objective name it. Objective journalists. Obamacare strikes, part-time jobs surge to all-time high, full-time jobs plunge by 240,000. 16,500 working, fewer hours due to Obamacare mandate. The mandate, one of the mandates we've been talking about so, here tonight. Let me press pause here before we re read... Uh, more of these headlines, which are incredibly illustrative and instructive, um, you know, so many of them deal with the cut in the number of hours for our, our wage earners during, you know, the worst economy since the Great Depression. Sure. And why is that happening? Why is that happening? Well, you know, you've, you've got employers that are now mandated to provide health insurance to their employees. And many of them, in order to remain profitable, um, must, must change their way of doing business. So they, they change people from full-time into a part-time status. They hire people into part-time positions rather than full-time positions. And then we have, perhaps most pathetically and, and tragically, we have what's been dubbed the 29er effect, where people are working more than 30 hours a week, many of whom are, are barely getting by, barely able to put food on the table and meet their utility bills and, and so on. They're getting dropped down to 29 or fewer hours. How is that helpful to the American people? And these are folks that the Obama administration says are full-time, but they're really not full-time. They may be working 35 hours a week don't even have a truly full-time 40-hour-a-week job, what we, what most folks across America know to be full-time. And who can, you know, we talked about this before, who said that 30 hours is full-time? Yeah. A lot of folks, if they're working 35 hours, they're trying to make ends meet, they'd rather work 40 and get some overtime. But what, what's happening is, they're being cut back below 30, which is not just the number of hours they work. It's simultaneously reducing the money they take home. That's right. That's right. And we have legislation here, again, to address this problem. Uh, the Saving American Workers Act. Uh, lots of co-sponsors here in the House. That's your uh, bill. I introduced the bill in response to the same sort of, of things I'm, I'm hearing from my colleagues who are in turn hearing from their constituents and the sort of things that I hear back home in Indiana, which is this is absolutely ridiculous. We're helping very few people uh, at the expense of many. Let's restore the definition of full time as it's always been popularly understood and provide some relief. That's right. And so we need to move forward on that. Let's continue to educate. Uh, and and, um, and uh, assess what's being uh, uh, reported across the country in some of these. Uh, Houston doctors to close doors because of Obamacare. Aetna letter warns customers many people will pay more for health insurance under Obamacare. East Penn cuts cafeteria workers' hours to avoid Obamacare. Affordable Care Act insurance mandates leading some businesses to cut employees' work hours. Limiting part-time hours, unintended result of health law. Maybe the unintended consequences has something to do with the fact that they didn't know half of what was in the law in the first place. That's right. Well, you know, I, I've, uh, I've seen some Indiana headlines, a number of them related to some of these effects. Uh, one pops out right there for me, the Indianapolis uh, News. School part-timers fear fewer hours, less pay as impact of health care law kicks in. Let's, let's remember, this is not just businesses that are being impacted. Uh, we've got municipalities, um, school workers, 
um, uh, you know, uh, your, your businesses, especially in your hospitality industry or your retail sector, uh, where uh, we see a lot more people being hired on a part-time basis. Um, seemingly, every, every aspect uh, of our economy and of our society is being adversely impacted uh, by this law. Now, that's not to say that some people aren't helped. All things being equal, if we can ensure a few more million people, that's a great thing. But with all the collateral damage created by this law, and its unsustainability. That's right. That's the real problem here. And we can help those people. We can help those people through other means. As I said before, the idea that it's the Obamacare model or nothing is a false choice. There are many other better patient-centered ways to do this, to reach the same goal. Health care law causing SCC to re-examine adjunct faculty members. Local employers struggle with Affordable Care Act. When employers are struggling, the workers are struggling. The families are struggling. Obamacare glitch could make coverage unaffordable for low-wage workers. Obamacare's $96 an hour cost spike may end 30-hour work week. We're getting short on time, so I think we ought to run through these, and I want to talk a little bit about where our bills are now, sitting at the other end of the Capitol. And I want to urge our Senate friends here in a minute to, to think about the opportunity they have. But let's take a quick look at these before we close out. Rancho Cucamonga may reduce part-time hours to avoid health care cost. Part-time staff hours in flux due to Obamacare. FWCS cuts hours for part-time positions. Maricopa Community College's staffs pinched by Obama health law. Dallas area cities, school districts expect budget hits from Affordable Care Act. And the good news just keeps on coming. There's a little sarcasm there. This is just awful. Yeah. Out in Colorado, Fort Collins small businesses prepare for Affordable Care Act changes. Uh, the World Herald districts to cut back paraprofessionals hours as a result of health care law. See, it's already in, even impacting paraprofessionals. Now. Uh, right now. Uh, Beacon Journal, uh, limiting part-time hours to avoid health care costs. More the same, impacting yet more Americans. Uh, requirements for health care reform and resulting requirements for Chesterfield County Public Schools. Salt Lake Tribune, ahead of the health reform, Granite District cuts part-time workers' hours. And the final one here, and there's so many more, one that I actually didn't get up here, was reported just tonight. In Ohio, they announced that premiums statewide are going up 41 percent. AAA parks full-time jobs, cites health law. Agencies must cut some part-timers' hours or offer health insurance. Part-time employee hours cut over health care. Fast food worker hours cut, new health care law blamed. I know we're short on time. We've got some other colleagues that want to talk tonight, but I just want to close by, first of all, thanking my colleague, uh, Representative Young of Indiana, for being here with me. But I'd just like to point out that the employer mandate bill that mimics what the president did, that postpones the employer mandate for one year, we passed it here with 35 Democrats, bipartisan. Your bill, the individual mandate postponement, 22 Democrats. We passed them out of here. We did our job. The worst they could say about my bill, the White House, is that it was redundant. Those bills are sitting down in the Senate waiting for action. Yeah, redundant to the Treasury Department's blog post. Right. It uh, bears reminding. They're sitting over there, gathering dust as the American people um, demand relief. And uh, it is so important. I, I want to um, join you and, and, and first thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, those in Arkansas are, are well represented uh, by you on, on this and, e and other matters, working very hard to ensure that where relief can be provided, 
we provide it. Where the prerogatives of the leg legislative branch uh, can be defended, you will defend them. Um, that's where I stand as well. We just need the United States Senate to act. And on the employer mandate delay, they should pass that immediately to make the president's actions legal, and they should pass the individual mandate delay to make the president's actions fair. I appreciate you being here with me tonight. You are an outstanding member of the Ways and Means Committee, and I appreciate your leadership. And uh, uh, we're running out of time, so I want to thank folks for joining us tonight, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Speakers announced policy of January 3rd, 2013. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, is recognized for the remainder of time until 10 p.m. as a designee of the majority leader. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. And I thank uh, Congressman Griffin for the opportunity here. Mr. Speaker, I thank you here uh, for yielding the time. Mr. Speaker, the tiny nation of Israel began in earnest more than 3,000 years ago. Since that time, the people of Israel have faced more heartaches, threats of annihilation, bigotry, torture, and genocide than any other people in the history of humanity. Yet even today in 2013, against all odds and opposition, the noble people of Israel remain. And the peace of Israel continues to be the linchpin of peace for the entire world. Today Israel faces another catastrophic challenge among the many in their long struggle throughout history that threatens to end their existence as a nation. The greatest challenge Israel faces today is the growing threat of a nuclear-armed Iran. This is a menace that also threatens the peace and security of the entire family of mankind. Mr. Speaker, Israel has been our truest friend and ally in the Middle East now for approximately 65 years. And during that entire time, it has faced many unthinkable threats from enemies who desire to see its absolute annihilation. Now more than ever before, the United States of America and the nation of Israel must stand together against the threat of a nuclear Iran. And those who would see our two nations and all those we love and all those who love human freedom eradicated from the face of the earth. One of the most important ways America can send a signal to the world that there is no space between us and Israel is to transfer our embassy to an existing newly constructed consulate in Jerusalem and once and for all make it clear that the United States officially and unequivocally recognizes Jerusalem as the undivided capital city of the state of Israel. This is something we should have done a long time ago, Mr. Speaker. However, there has never been a more important time to do it because the world today, including some of our most dangerous enemies, doubt America's resolve to stand with Israel. And the actions of the Obama administration would create such doubt in any reasonable person's mind. For instance, when it was announced that the Israeli government had completed one more step in the permit process for building houses in Jerusalem, the Obama administration openly rebuked Israel and demanded that they do several things by way of, quote, penance for building houses for its citizens. Now, Mr. Speaker, I cannot tell you how bewildering it is for me as an American congressman to hear our own American president expressing more outrage toward Israel for building homes in its own capital city than he has expressed toward a madman like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad for building nuclear weapons with which to threaten the peace and security of the entire world. Mr. Obama demanded that the permits be canceled despite the fact that every prime minister of Israel has allowed them in their capital. Mr. Obama told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to make a, quote, substantial gesture toward the Palestinians and release Palestinian prisoners. Mr. Obama has made no such demands of the Palestinians, and the Palestinians have made no such concessions. In fact, Mr. Speaker, every concession that Israel has ever made for decades has been met and responded to 
by violence and terror. Nevertheless, President Obama is continuing to assist, insist that uh, Israeli publicly state the, that, that Israel publicly state its willingness to negotiate the division of Jerusalem and the right of return from millions of descendants of Palestinian refugees to Israel. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, no president in our history has been more bent upon isolating our friends and emboldening our enemies as this president. And, and Mr. Speaker, it, it places Israel in a great conundrum. For if on the one hand they take military action to halt Iran's nuclear program, the world, including this administration, will openly condemn them, and they will face intense isolation and hostility from the international community. On the other hand, if they do not take action and they allow Iran to gain nuclear weapons, they face the real and imminent possibility that Iran will either directly or through its proxies unleash a nuclear hell on earth that will annihilate their tiny homeland. It is perilous beyond description for us all, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the free world doesn't seem to understand the gravity of allowing Iranian regime and the government of Iran today to gain nuclear weapons capability. It is vital for those of us in Congress to make it clear that America's commitment to Israel remains steadfast and that Israel's enemy is America's enemy. Once again, Mr. Speaker, America should take a major effort and make a major statement to that effect by transferring our embassy to Israel's capital city, Jerusalem. This move would require nothing from American taxpayers. It would uh, could happen by selling the current embassy in Tel Aviv, and that could even bring a substantial upside to America financially. This is something that we need to do for the sake of making it clear to the world that we will stand by Israel. America has established bilateral relations with so many nations across the world, and in each case we have recognized their capital city. Yet when it has come to the state of Israel, our most critical and cherished ally on this earth. Israel's capital city of Jerusalem is the only one in the world which we have yet to recognize. Ironically, Mr. Speaker, it was America that was the first nation on earth to recognize Israel as a nation, a mere 11 minutes after Israel's declaration. President Harry Truman said, quote, I had faith in Israel before it was established, I have faith in it now. I believe it has a glorious future before it, not just as another sovereign nation, but as an embodiment of the great ideals of human civilization." Unquote. Mr. Speaker, if America now ignores the opportunity to be the first to fully recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city, can we truly claim that we are Israel's nearest and dearest friend? And can we honestly say that we are fully committed to our own principles? The majority of Israel's citizens and leaders have yearned for their capital city's recognition by the people of the world and moreover by the people of the United States for so very long. Israel's capital city houses its government framework, including the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, the Supreme Court, the Bank of Israel, its diplomatic corps, the, foreign ministry of, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Prime Minister and President's Office, and very significantly, Jerusalem surrounds many of Israel's most sacred remembrances, including the tombs of the fallen soldiers on Mount Herzl, as well as the symbol of the most insidious injustice ever endured by the Jewish people, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. Mr. Speaker, not so long ago, one of the members of this house said very eruditely and arrogantly, he said, I don't take sides for or against Israel, and I don't take sides for or against Hezbollah. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that that is more dangerous, that kind of moral equivalence, that kind of moral neutrality. It's more dangerous to humanity than terrorism itself. Ronald Reagan gave an address in 1983 when the world faced a similar threat in the, glowing, in the growing strength and nuclear ambition of the Soviet Union. He stated, quote, I urge you to beware the temptation to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil, unquote. 
Mr. Speaker, we cannot remove ourselves from that struggle. Let us all be reminded that we have been here before. The free nations of the world once had opportunity to address the insidious rise of the Nazi ideology in its formative years, when it could have been dispatched without great cost. But they delayed, and the result was atomic bombs falling on cities, 50 million people dead worldwide, and the swastika shadow nearly plunging the planet into Sumerian darkness. You know, it is said that those who survived the Holocaust achieved their revenge through simply living. Rather than allowing their faith and their hopes to be crushed by the atrocities of the past, they chose instead to dry their tears and to look up and to begin building again. And indeed they did build again. They built a future and a family and a community and a nation. And Mr. Speaker, the God of Jacob honored their courage. The threat of the Nazis is no more. And one day this threat of global jihad will be no more. Mr. Speaker, recognizing Jerusalem as the rightful capital of Israel is not solely an act of foreign attributes and powers. It is the noble act of courage and justice that comports with everything that America is. We have assisted the Jewish people in restoring their ancient state. We must now act and recognize her restored ancient city, Jerusalem. Together, we can ensure that Jerusalem continues to be a center for answered prayers and dreams come true. And I pray that the United States will be the first nation to officially and formally recognize Israel's capital city and to transfer our embassy to Jerusalem. This will undeniably affirm our commitment and our resolve on behalf of Israel. And we will be standing steadfastly on our own Declaration of Independence as well, Mr. Speaker, as on the right side of history. With that, Mr. Speaker, I would just pray that the light of God's peace will shine down upon the streets of Jerusalem forever. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. The gentleman...